Audi. It's Kyle going over the 10 worst cities in the U.S. And I'm only going to be examining the central city and county for metropolitan areas greater than 1 million people. And there are all kinds of websites and publications and YouTube videos talking about this subject, but they always sound the exact same. They only ever go over the same couple of categories. And usually it's just housing costs and crime with the only two uh, categories that even consider to what makes a bad city. But there's so much more to what makes a city good or bad than just housing costs and crime. So in this video, I'm going to talk about what are the worst cities. If you're interested in just going straight to the countdown, I'll put a, a chapter timestamp you can skip to. But I want to go over the methodology for this video because this list is going to look a lot different than other videos like this. Every city has plenty of negative things going on there. You have traffic and crowds and congestion and pollution, noise, crime, just all the hassles and frustrations you get to put up with to live in a big city. But why do folks put up with all those negative things? Well, they put up with it to get some of the positive things that cities have to offer. I think just about everybody would agree that restaurants and shopping are two things that are very important about living in a city. And I think the vast majority of people would think that at least some of the following are also important. So whether it's bars or microbreweries or nightlife or live music or live theater, pro sports, whether it be major league or minor league, or maybe the sports bars or bowling alleys or billiards or you know botanical gardens, zoos, art museums, the, the high arts like ballet or opera or symphony, rock climbing walls, bike trails, just all kind of stuff that people want to get out of a city. I mean, most people aren't going to be into all that stuff, but pretty much everyone's going to be into at least a few of those things. The term I use is return on investment. You're investing your time. You're investing your patience and frustrations into putting up with all these negative things about cities in hopes you're going to get some of these positive things. And like I was saying before, most other lists like this are only going to talk about housing costs and crime and talking about what makes a good or a bad city. And they're not going to talk at all about some of these city amenities and things that are positive about cities. But I would say the most important things to somebody are low housing costs, low crime, and they don't care about some of those positive things about cities and a city probably isn't the best place for that person so you can get much more out of what you want in life from a small town with low housing costs low crime and doesn't have those amenities you don't care about so in this video i'm going to be talking about the 10 cities i think give the worst return on investment and what makes these the 10 worst cities in the u.s at number 10 is Dallas. And right off the bat, I'm probably going to get a lot of hate here because Dallas is very popular. A lot of people love it and it's growing a lot. It's the ninth biggest city in the country with about 1.3 million people. Dallas County is the eighth most populous county in the U.S. at 2.7 million. And the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex has over 7.8 million people. It's the fifth largest metro in the U.S. And there are a lot of great things about Dallas, a lot of great neighborhoods. Deep Ellum is kind of your younger, hipper nightlife kind of area with a lot of live music and restaurants and bars. Uptown is another area with a lot of local boutiques and restaurants. Oak Lawn is one of the most vibrant neighborhoods in America. You have an area called Knox Henderson, I think, which is a lot of upscale luxury type stuff and a lot of you know great neighborhoods in Dallas. So all of that is great, but why I have it on this list is that, again, 7.8 million people in the Metroplex, and it doesn't really feel like it when you talk about the city amenities. So, for example, that's twice the size as Denver Metro, but Dallas doesn't offer twice as much as what Denver does. And Atlanta has, quote-unquote, only 6 million people, but Atlanta has more kind of big city, big-time stuff there. To me, it feels like a smaller city, like the city's ranked more in the 15th to 20th ranking, so more like Denver or the Twin Cities kind of metro area where it's way bigger than those, but doesn't really feel any more big time than those. At number nine is Baltimore, Maryland. You look at a bunch of lists like this, and Baltimore is often going to be number one or certainly in the top three in terms of worst cities. And a lot of the problems with Baltimore are pretty well documented. It has a declining population. There's about 590,000 people in the city. It's the 30th largest city in the U.S., and Baltimore County has about 830,000 people, but Baltimore County is a completely separate entity from the city of Baltimore. It's one of the most important cities in terms of U.S. history, and it's home to a lot of great historic neighborhoods, including Federal Hill, which is where Fort McHenry is, and also an area called Fells Point, which is a very historic, this is more of your bar and nightlife kind of entertainment district. And there are some other nice neighborhoods there. You have the Hampton area, which is kind of like your your gentrified area, which is kind of hip and young with a lot of local boutiques and restaurants. And then you have the Inner Harbor, which is kind of like the, the main touristy type area right in the heart of downtown. But it's kind of gone downhill in recent years. 
but even before it was going downhill, it still wasn't all that great. It's kind of like your typical touristy area with your chain restaurants like Bubba Gump's and Ruth's Chris and the Hard Rock Cafe. And even though I'm not using crime as a number one indicator of what makes a bad city, you can't overlook the fact that Baltimore has incredibly high crime rates. And what makes things worse for Baltimore is that because it's so close to D.C., which is very expensive, Baltimore itself is not anywhere near as cheap as it should be. But the positive things about Baltimore nowhere near match the size of the city and don't even come close to making up for some of the negatives. At number 8 is Los Angeles, and this is the second largest city in the U.S., about 3.9 million people in the U.S. Los Angeles County is the most populous county in the U.S. at right about 10 million people. However, over the past few years, it has been declining in population. And of course, if we're talking about big time, international, world city kind of stuff, LA is certainly going to be like that and has a lot of wonderful things about the city. I mean, everything from the world class chefs and nightlife and the music scene and, of course, the beaches and just being outdoor and that wonderful weather. But when I talk about return on investment, your investment in LA is crazy. I mean, the time. The hassle, just the frustration of putting up with L.A. just drives you absolutely crazy. On top of the fact that the monetary investment where it's really expensive to live there. And for all of the wonderful things you can get out of L.A., things you can only do there and nowhere else in the world, I don't think it makes up for all the hassles you have to put up with. But what it comes down to is that it's just too big. It's just, it's just too much. And that's not just me saying that. People are leaving the city. So people are willing to put up with the high cost of living in San Diego or Santa Barbara, which are still growing, or San Jose. But for L.A., they aren't because it's just too freaking big. At number seven is Birmingham, Alabama. There's a population of about 207,000 people, and it's declining. And the metro area has just over a million people, and it's gaining slightly. The median house value is $99,000. There's a 25% poverty rate and a very high crime rate. There are some decent neighborhoods in the city. Downtown is okay, but the kind of the main entertainment and nightlife area is called Five Point South. It's near the UAB College Campus in the Medical District. Uh, you get a lot of restaurants and bars and nightlife stuff and some good historic homes there as well. An area that we actually like, we'll go down to Birmingham every now and then to visit an area called Homewood. Got like a nice little main street there, some local businesses, and some pretty cool shops. All of those things are okay, but again, there's a metro area of over 1 million people, so it doesn't really offer as much as other cities of that same size range. That's going to be the theme for the next few on this list, to just feel a lot smaller than what it really is. At number 6 is Rochester, New York, and it's in a pretty similar boat as Birmingham. The city has a population of about 200,000, and the metro area has just over 1 million, and both are declining. It's a 25% poverty rate and a high crime rate to go along with it. But the reason why it's on this list is that it's way too big to offer the little that it does. The downtown is pretty weak, especially compared to other cities in this size range. And the main kind of entertainment and restaurant areas are along Park Avenue and Monroe Avenue, which are okay for a city significantly smaller. Rochester is almost as big as Buffalo in terms of population, but it's nowhere near as big as Buffalo in terms of feel. It just has the feel of a significantly smaller city, but with a bunch of skyscrapers downtown that makes it look bigger. And it's a pretty cheap place to live. Houses are cheap, so those really high New York property taxes aren't going to affect you that much. But people are still leaving because there's just no job opportunities and there just really isn't much to keep you there. Similar to Birmingham and Rochester, at number 5 is Dayton, Ohio. There are about 140,000 people in the city with a slight decline in population, a little over 1 million people in the metro area with a slight decline in population, but there is a little bit of growth in the northern and southern suburbs, however. It has a 30% poverty rate and a median house value of $68,000. So you combine that with fairly low taxes in Ohio and the overall cost of living in Dayton is pretty low. But it's pretty similar to Rochester in a lot of ways, including how the downtown is just not that impressive, although it does look kind of impressive in terms of the high-rises. The main historic and entertainment district in the city is called the Oregon Historic District, and this is where you have a lot of local boutiques and bars and restaurants. But this is pretty underwhelming for the largest city in the metro area over 1 million people. And it hurts Dayton to be kind of sandwiched in between two much more interesting big cities with Cincinnati being about 45 minutes to the southwest and Columbus being about an hour east. 
Now there are some pretty nice outdoor type stuff in the area, some whitewater kayaking right in the middle of downtown and some other interesting walking and biking trails throughout the metro area, but it's nowhere near enough to make up for the fact that this really doesn't offer a whole lot for a metro area of over 1 million people. And number four is Hartford, Connecticut. And just like Birmingham, Rochester, and Dayton, the population is going down. There's about 120,000 people in the city. The overall metro area has about 1.3 million people, and that's also declining. There's a 27% poverty rate and a pretty high crime rate as well. The median house value is $173,000, which is low compared to the rest of the U.S., but it's fairly high compared to other cities in its category that are also struggling economically. There are some decent neighborhoods in the city. The downtown is okay. The main entertainment district is along Front Street, which has some decent uh, shops and restaurants and bars and stuff. And the gentrified area is Parkville, but it isn't crazy. It's not super hipster and cool, which I guess is not necessarily a bad thing for a gentrified area. But at the same time, the city is really struggling. A lot of poverty, a lot of jobs leaving. This isn't really much going on in terms of economic development. And the city was pretty close to filing for bankruptcy. But the main reason why I have Hartford ranked worse than Birmingham, Rochester, or Dayton, even though they're all kind of similar size, is that those are all pretty cheap. Hartford is not that cheap, but housing is kind of expensive, and taxes are kind of high, too. Okay, so this is where the video is going to take kind of a surprising turn. At number three is Phoenix, Arizona. The city has a population of about 1.7 million people. It's the fifth largest city in the U.S., it's located within Maricopa County, which has about 4.5 million. That's the fourth most populous county in the country. And the overall Phoenix metro area has over 5 million people. It's the 12th most populous metro in the U.S. The reason why I have Phoenix ranked so high on this list is that it's just kind of an underwhelming city for something of its size. It's huge, but doesn't feel anywhere near as big as other cities in this size range. So like I was saying in the beginning of the video, Dallas feels like a much smaller city, maybe like about the size of Phoenix, and Phoenix feels like a much smaller city, more like in this range of, say, St. Louis. There are some interesting neighborhoods in the city. The downtown is okay, but underwhelming for such a big city. There's an area called the Cityscape, which has got some entertainment and shopping, but it's not anything spectacular. Other areas called Roosevelt Row, some nice boutiques and nightlife and restaurants, but again, it's just not anything spectacular compared to other cities in the size range like Seattle or Denver. And some of the best things about the Phoenix metro area aren't in the city of Phoenix itself, such as Old Town Scottsdale, which is kind of like your luxury boutiques and nightlife kind of stuff in the suburb of Scottsdale. Or in the suburb of Tempe, which is the home to Arizona State University, you have Mill Avenue, which is like your main party nightlife, just, you know, crazy bar and nightlife scene. And so you compare that to other cities in the size range, again, like Seattle or Denver, or also like Detroit or Tampa, just has much more of a personality, much more of a unique feel. There are things to those places that are only in those places where Phoenix feels more like just a giant suburb with a lot of people. So I want to once again bring up return on investment. It's a big city, a lot of traffic and congestion, a lot of hassles and frustration with putting up the big city stuff. But what you get in return isn't as much as you would get in other cities with this size range. So that's why Phoenix ranked so high on this list. At number two is Las Vegas. And when I say it, Vegas is a bad city, I'm not saying as a place to go. It's a great place to visit. I've been there at least 10 times or so, and you can have a great time going there and hanging out. But I'm talking about the actual city itself. The city of Las Vegas has a population of about 660,000 people. It's the 27th largest city in the U.S., Clark County, in which it lies, has about 2.3 million people, which makes it the 11th most populous county in the country. And the overall Vegas metropolitan area has 2.3 million people, and it's the 27th largest metro in the U.S. So it isn't just a big tour of destination, it's also a really big city. Now I assure you, I didn't just scour the internet looking for these area photographs to make Vegas look really bad. This is actually what the majority of Metro Las Vegas looks like. The vast majority of the development in the Las Vegas area has been in the past 20 to 30 years. So what you see in terms of development and subdivisions is that type of that new mantra of development that you've seen in the past 20, 30 years. And so here's an aerial photograph of one of the more quote unquote older and established suburbs called Spring Valley. And even the older type suburbs look kind of the same as the newer ones just has no soul to it. So earlier I ripped on Rochester for having just a small little area that's kind of unique, got some interesting local boutiques and stuff and Dayton also, but Vegas doesn't have any of that kind of stuff. It's all just this giant suburb, all very cookie cutter, no soul, no personality. 
So look at places like Tucson, Arizona, or Albuquerque, New Mexico, or El Paso, Texas. Other desert-type cities that are much smaller than Vegas that have a soul. There's an identity to them. There's a personality. There's cool neighborhoods. There's things about those places that make it unique to those places where Vegas is basically one giant suburban subdivision. And by law of averages, there are going to be people watching this video that live in Las Vegas. And please let me know in the comments. I genuinely want to know what people like about Las Vegas. What is the draw to living there? Because I just don't get it. And so now we get to what I think is the worst city in the U.S. And if you've been with this channel for a while, you know exactly what it is. And that's beautiful Orlando, Florida. The city itself has about 300,000 people. Orange County, in which it lies, has about 1.5 million. And the Orlando metropolitan area has over 3 million people. It's ranked about 17th or 18th in terms of overall U.S. metros. It's huge and growing very, very quickly. And I never technically lived in Orlando, but my wife went to graduate school at the University of Central Florida, which is there. And this is before we were married, but I spent a lot of time down there and just learned to really don't like this place. But the reasons why I hate Orlando so much are basically the same reasons about Vegas. It's just all recent development of the past 20 to 30 years, and everything is just very sterile, very overly planned. A lot of homeowners associations, a lot of new cookie cutter subdivisions. There's just no soul or personality to the city. So here's a satellite image of the area to give you an idea of just how spread out it is. Everything is flat, so they have to have a lot of areas that are set aside for drainage, and there's all kinds of different ponds. You have all these lakes and all these areas that you don't build on, and then, again, a lot of areas that aren't lakes are sinkholes, so you just have to avoid all this stuff. So everything just takes up way more space than it really should, and it takes way more time to cross the city than it should. And all that is exacerbated by the fact that it has really expensive toll roads. All the freeways going through the metro area are toll roads with the exception of Interstate 4. And depending on how long your commute is, these tolls can be really expensive. It's not out of the question that you might pay over $1,000 a year in tolls. It's crazy. So with it being so inauthentic and artificial and just being so spread out and crowded, all the tourists and the tolls, and it just has no personality or soul to it, and on top of that, there's no beach. That's why I think Orlando is the worst city in the U.S. And just like Vegas, please do let me know in the comment section for people that live in Orlando what you like about it and what the draw to living there is because I really just don't see it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about U.S. geography. I'm comparing and contrasting cities and states in all kinds of different categories, talking about cross-country road tripping, doing videos like this where I'm ranking things. Just everything I talk about comes from a little more nerdy type perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.